in the last video, we did a bunch of algebra. We laid the groundwork for um, uh, establishing the difference identity for cosine. Since we've done all of that work already, the uh, sum identity for cosine tends to go uh, much, much more quickly. So let's do that here at the beginning of this video. If we use a little bit of algebra here, we might recognize that cosine of alpha plus beta, well, that could be rewritten as a difference problem, as long as we call it cosine of alpha minus negative beta. So these two mean the same thing, and I'm, I'm going to use the trick here. Since we've just proven something true about the difference of two angles, I'm going to use that to our advantage, and I'm going to use that to prove something else that's true about this particular statement here. All right, so um, on the left-hand side, I'm going to write cosine of alpha minus negative beta is really equal to cosine of alpha times cosine of negative beta plus sine alpha times sine of negative beta. And I get to write this because this is what we just showed in the last video. We just showed that this is a true substitution for the cosine of the difference of two angles. So um, to clean this up on the left hand side, I'm now going to put this back into the form that I would like for it to be in. So I have cosine of alpha plus beta. And that's equal to cosine of alpha times cosine of positive beta. Do you know why? Do you know why these two are the same? Well, that comes back to our sum and difference identities. I'm sorry, our, uh, our fundamental identities that we've been talking about for the past week. So if I just go back one day to yesterday's notes, we have our fundamental identities here. Uh, don't forget about the old even and odd identities. And there's one right here that states that cosine evaluated at a negative number is exactly the same as cosine evaluated at the positive form of that number. And that's because cosine is what we call an even function. So because of that, I can just replace cosine of negative beta with cosine of positive beta. Now sine is similar but not exactly the same. We have cosine, I'm sorry, sine of alpha times negative sine of beta. So the negative symbol in front of beta can be moved from the angle measure and placed in front of the sine function. And um, I guess that's okay to put there, but to really make this stand out and and look like the identities that we're used to, you might write it this way. I'll leave cosine of alpha times cosine of beta alone, but now instead of writing a plus sign between these two, I'm gonna move this negative sign one more time because a positive sine alpha times a negative sine beta leaves us with a negative result, sine alpha times sine beta. And again, wouldn't you know it, all of that legwork has paid off. This is the second identity that we wanted to prove. This is the sum identity for cosine. We see that the sum of two angles inside of a cosine function is equal to cosine of the first angle times cosine of the second minus sine of the first angle times sine of the second. Okay, we're on a roll now. Let's see if we can complete the proof for the sum identity for sine. Uh, now before we begin, let's just talk a little bit about how uh, sine and cosine are related to one another. Uh, let's suppose that I had sine evaluated at some angle measure theta. Uh, don't forget that this is exactly the same as cosine evaluated at the same angle measure minus pi over two. Now I wanna illustrate this by using a graph for just a second. Um, what we're saying is that the original sine wave, sine curve, is the same as the cosine curve if you shift that cosine curve to the right pi over 2 units. And we talked about this way back on day 51 when we were completing our graphs. Uh, 
The blue graph is our sine function. If I were to uh, shift the cosine function, which is red, to the right 90 degrees or, or pi over 2, then every data point would land directly on top of this sine function. So that's what we're saying. Or at least it's worth noting that sine would be the same as cosine as long as we subtract pi over 2. That's what's going to complete our rightward shift. So uh, since we're going to work on the sine identity, I'm sorry, the sum identity for sine here, what we're going to do is we're going to start with this sine of alpha plus beta. We're going to come up with a new way to write the right hand side of it and see if we can establish an identity just like what we've seen over the last two days. So I might say this, that sine of alpha plus beta is really equal to cosine of alpha plus beta minus pi over 2. And again, I was able to do that because of this uh, previous note, the fact that a cosine graph is the same as the sine graph as long as it's been, as long as it's been shifted to the right pi over 2 units. But here's something that I'd like for you to see from this layout. Let's imagine that we grouped beta minus pi over 2, and I call that its own angle. So angle beta minus pi over 2, and I now have angle alpha by itself. This cosine command is utilizing an angle plus another angle. Well, that's the sum rule for cosine. That's the sum identity for cosine. So what we've just done here is we've utilized, or we're, we're about to utilize, one of the other identities that we've just proven. So I'd like to rewrite that equation now in this form from the right-hand side of our previous identity. Now, the sum rule for cosine says that I can evaluate cosine of the first angle and multiply that by cosine of the second angle. Now the second angle in this case happens to be beta minus pi over 2. And from that I'll subtract sine of alpha times sine of the second angle, which is beta minus pi over 2. Okay. Now, did you notice that we created another cosine of an angle minus pi over 2? So let's, let's use this uh, first note one more time and rewrite this expression a, a little bit more nicely here. So we now have cosine alpha times sine of beta. Again, I can make this switch because of this previous note. Cosine of an angle minus pi over 2 is really the same as sine evaluated at that angle. So cosine of beta minus 2 minus pi over 2 is really the same as just sine of beta. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to point this one out. Um, cosine of an angle measure is also equal to sine of that angle measure plus pi over 2. So in a similar argument, um, if we had our cosine function shifted back left, I'm sorry, our sine function shifted back left, that's what would allow it to land on top of our cosine graph. So we can shift a sine function uh, from, from its position to the left to generate or to match a cosine function. And we can shift our uh, cosine function to the right to land on our sine function. So uh, we're going to use that thought to finish out this statement here. So I'm going to copy the minus sine of alpha. And I think I'm going to rewrite this line just a little bit here. Let's factor out a negative 1. So we get the negative 1 times negative beta plus pi over 2. Now doing that unusual factor does two things for us. It allows us to um, take this negative symbol, right, this negative symbol inside the sine function. We've got this extra negative sign because of our even and odd identities. I can bring this thing out and change this negative sign to a plus sign. So cosine alpha sine beta plus sine alpha times sine of negative beta 
plus pi over 2. So that's the first thing that it did is it allow us to bring this negative sign out because of our even odd identities. But now I've got this sine function written in this form. I've got an angle plus pi over 2. Sine of some angle plus pi over 2 could be rewritten as cosine. So now um, rewriting cosine alpha sine beta plus sine alpha sine alpha now times cosine of negative beta. And we're almost there. We know something about a negative angle measure inside of cosine. Well, because of the even odd identities, we can simply rewrite that cosine of a negative number as cosine of the positive number. So we've got cosine alpha times sine beta plus sine alpha Sorry, my Greek letters aren't working very well. Sine alpha times cosine of positive beta. And so what we've just shown, we've really just worked on the right-hand side of our equation, is that sine of alpha plus beta is equal to this phrase on the right side. Cosine alpha sine beta plus sine alpha cosine beta. And that is our third sum slash difference identity. All right, so we're almost there. Let's finish out the video by establishing our difference identity for sine. So much the same way that we did with the difference identity for cosine, let's recognize that sine of alpha minus beta is really the same as sine of alpha plus a negative beta. And as long as we recognize that as true, then the left side of the function will stay the same. Sine of alpha minus beta is really equal to, now we get to utilize the sum rule for our sine, the sum identity for sine that we just established a minute ago. So this sum of two angles would be equal to cosine of the first angle times sine of the second minus, I'm sorry, plus, because we're still working with the sum identity, plus sine of alpha times cosine of negative beta. From our even and odd identities, we can say that this group here, all we can do is bring that negative sign out to the front because it's a negative symbol inside of our sine function. We now have negative cosine alpha times sine beta plus sine alpha times cosine of beta. This negative symbol just disappears because of the even odd identity for cosine. And while this line is pretty good, let's go ahead and write it this way just so that it looks like the examples we've seen already. Instead of leading with a negative coefficient, we're going to write the function this way. Sine alpha times cosine beta minus cosine alpha times sine beta. And this is our fourth trig identity for sums and differences. Okay, so I'll stop the video here. We've worked through four proofs in the last 45 minutes or so, and um, that's quite a lot of work. But you've got to realize that mathematicians uh, throughout the years have had to do work like this in order to provide the formulas that you and I are so used to using in class each day. So it's good to know where some of these formulas come from. It's good to know the proofs that go into uh, these designs. What I would like to do is challenge you to deriving the sum and difference rules for tangent. So I'm not going to show them in this video, but here's at least a hint to get you started. Uh, we can say that uh, tangent of two angles added together is equal to sine of those two angles divided by cosine of those two angles. And then by using our sum rule for sine and our sum identity for cosine, we could then rewrite 
these two lines, the numerator and the denominator, and do some interesting work from there. So if I zoom out, hopefully to the point where you can't read anymore, uh, really in just two more lines by finding some common denominators, you should be able to establish the sum identity for tangent. And in a similar fashion, you can do the difference identity for tangent as well, utilizing the difference identities for sine and cosine. So feel free to give those a try. You also have classroom activity 25 that you could be working on, as well as the practice problems from the textbook that I've outlined in ANGEL.